Hi, this is Irv Shapiro with the Dr. Vax channel. And today we're going to cover both a legal issue, a social political issue, and some technical issues. We're going to compare four different printers, ranging from a printer that fully assembled is a thousand dollars down to a printer that's about $230, a printer in the middle that we'll look at, the Monoprice Ultimate 2, that's about $550, and the least expensive printer here, the Anet ET4, that ranges between about $180 and $230, depending on the model. And the question we're going to ask is, does open source firmware matter? But to get started, we need to understand what open source is. So stay tuned and let's learn something together. In some ways, this could be thought of as the tale of four printers. This Prusa i3 MK3 is the very first 3D printer I owned. I purchased it as a kit. This Ender 3 version 2 is the latest 3D printer I've purchased. The Monoprice Ultimate 2 was a printer provided to me by Monoprice in order to do a review, as was the Anet ET4. While these four printers share a lot of common characteristics. They're all FDM or filament based printers that became possible when the patents for Stratasys expired over about the last 10 years. And they all fundamentally do the same thing. But in other ways, they're very different. And one of the ways they're most different is their parent company's perspective on open source software. So let's start by talking about intellectual property. You work really hard. You create something. You invent something. And as we'll see in a moment, creation and invention are different from the eyes, from the view of the law, at least American and European law. Should you have the exclusive right to that idea, to that invention for some period of time? So there are two sides to the argument. Fundamentally, one side is you invented it. It's yours. If you don't have exclusive rights, if you can't protect your invention, then Someone else is just going to copy it. They didn't put in all the effort to invent it. So they're getting the invention for free and there'll be no incentive for you to invent more things. The other side of the argument could simply be stated as ideas are free. Ideas should be freely shared. By sharing ideas, we increase the number of people collaborating on those ideas and those inventions, in fact, are better. And the way you should make money is by providing support for your idea, by the execution of your idea. Well, there will never be a conclusion to this argument because both sides are rational and appropriate. So let me step back for a moment and tell you about the current state of Western law. I'm not a lawyer. These are not legal opinions. This is my understanding as a software engineer, a technologist who's been doing this for about 40 years. The first concept is copyright. If you produce a creative work, a book, 
a movie, a song, the script for a play, you produce that copy, you have a right to protect that copy. That's called a copyright. In most of the Western countries, copyright laws are applied to software. So software is copyrighted. The second concept is a little bit different. That's the concept of a patent. When you create an invention, and the idea originally was these are physical inventions. These are things that do things. They're not ideas. They're actual inventions. When you create an invention, a physical thing, you can apply and pay for a patent on those ideas, on those inventions. So Stratasys invented the idea of FDM printing, filament-based printing. And for 20 years, no one else could make an FDM printer. Now, if you want to learn more details about these legal concepts, Thomas Salanderer, Tom's channel on YouTube, and I'll put a link down below and I'll put a link in the description, has some excellent, excellent videos about the legal details but about concerning copyrights, patents, and trademarks. So what is open source? Well, open source fundamentally, as viewed by the general consumer community, is free stuff. But there's lots of free stuff that's not open source. You can watch the Dr. Vax videos for free. Those videos, however, are covered by a copyright. So you can't resell the Dr. Vax videos. You can't redistribute the Dr. Vax videos without permission. But it's still free. So open source does not mean free. It means something different. And to understand that, we need to first understand something about software. The, a program or an application running on a computer, any type of computer, the computer on the control board of this printer, the computer in my iPhone, the computer on your desktop, the computer in a data center, all of those computers execute or run or follow instructions in binary, encoded in a format of ones and zeros that's generally not human readable. But it'd be very hard, and originally this is how it was done on computers, it's very hard to program computers to put together the steps, the recipe, in binary. So instead, we program computers in a representation, in a language. It's converted from the human readable format, written in, let's say, Python or JavaScript, to the binary format. When I buy a program from Microsoft, Microsoft Word, I get a binary formative file designed to run on my computer. Now, I don't get the source code. Because I don't have the source code, I can't modify my copy of the program because I don't have the original source code. Open source is a concept where the author or owner or creator of the original program decides two things. Number one, they're going to distribute the source code. So anybody can modify that program and produce a new executable. Number two, it's generally done for free. But that's a caveat. Open source software still has a license. Let's explain what a license is. A license is just an agreement. It's a contract between someone who rents or uses or downloads or purchases something about how they can use that. It's an agreement. When I download a program from Microsoft and I've paid for it, or it's a free demo even, uh, there's a bunch of legal stuff that everyone just clicks through and says, yes, I agree, that's the license. It says what I can do. In the case of Microsoft, it says expressly, I can't attempt to modify the program, I can't redistribute it, I can't sell it to other people, 
I can't even attempt to reverse engineer it. That means to convert the ones and zeros, the binary back to source code. That's a license. Well, open source software, even though it's normally free and the source code is distributed, still has a license. There are many different licenses depending on the open source software you're using. Most open source software in the license expressly states that you can use it. Maybe you can use it for anything you want, but if you modify it and redistribute it, what you modify and redistribute also must be open source. So you must continue the chain of creativity from one author to the next. And generally you must be give credit Basically say, the original source code was produced by John. I'm giving credit to John as the author, and I've modified it. Now, the concept of open source applies to both programs. It can apply to inventions. It can apply to creative works. When applied to creative works, it's often called copy left instead of copyright, a bit of a play on words. So many of the images that you download that are free on the internet are copy left images that says you have the right to use it. Maybe you can even redistribute it freely, but you can't charge people money for someone else's work. Okay, now how does that apply to 3D printing? Much of the software we use in the 3D printing world, not all of it, but much of it comes from the open source world. Anyone who's used the Cura Slicer is using open source software. The creator of Cura created that software product for a particular line of printers, but they made it open source and anyone can use it collaboratively. So when you have open source software, you need a way to distribute the source. A very popular way to distribute the source is a service on the internet called GitHub, where you can publish the source code, the human readable format, anyone can download it and create a new version. So there are many, many 3D printer manufacturers that either recommend Cura for use with their 3D printers to slice their models, or they download a version of Cura, modify it a bit, and redistribute it with their printers. But they can't charge for it, and their modified version theoretically has to be made available to everyone. Now, the other piece of software that's fundamental to 3D printing is the software that controls a 3D printer. So inside every 3D printer is a computer. It's on the control board. That computer needs software to operate. That software, because it's on a control board embedded in a machine, is called firmware. The most popular, but not the only firmware available for 3D printing is called Marlin. Every one of the printers here has a relationship to Marlin, but the relationship might be different. So now let's dive into our printers talk about each of them, compare them a bit, then talk about what the advantages are for those printers that use fully properly open software, meaning they redistribute their source code to any modifications. Now to the manufacturers that are probably not adhering to the license completely. So the first 3D printer ever purchased was a Prusa i3 MK3. I do not recommend that as a first printer, as a kit for people new to 3D printing. It is the most complex assembly of any 3D printer I've ever used. And part of it is because of its philosophical connection to 3D printing to an open source project called RepRap. The RepRap project that began in England in about 2005, 2006 
was an effort to produce a manufacturing machine that could reproduce itself. As humans, we reproduce ourselves. Machines should be able to reproduce themselves. So the inventors wanted to create a machine that was completely open source. Everything was available to anyone who wanted to download it. And more importantly, it could recreate itself. So while the first RepRap printer was hand created, later versions of that printer used as many 3D printed components as possible, combined with off the shelf components. So you could use a RepRap printer to produce more RepRap printers. That's really the philosophy behind Prusa. Almost all of the plastic parts on this printer are 3D printed versus being injection molded, which you'll see on some of the other printers. And therefore, the parts have to follow the constraints of what 3D printers can print. There are things that 3D printers can produce that other manufacturing processes cannot. There are also things and characteristics of other manufacturing processes that are, in some cases, superior to 3D printing. On this printer, wherever possible, a 3D printed component is used. That means, as an example, this hot end has a large number of small components that made it very difficult to assemble. The assembly of this printer took me over six hours. Now, it was the first 3D printer I ever put together. Maybe I could do it in four hours today. But in fact, I have an upgrade kit for this printer. I 3D printed all the parts to turn this from an i3 MK3 to an i3 MK3S. And that's a change to the filament sensor on this printer. I haven't done it. Why? because it's so painful working on this printer. It's hard to get into the electronics. Um, everything's very tight. There are lots of little pieces. On the other hand, this printer is completely open source. I can go on the internet. I can download the firmware. I can download the source code for the firmware. I can download the plans. All of the 3D printed parts, the plans are freely available. It is truly an open source printer. Now I can buy a Prusa i3 MK3 for a thousand dollars fully assembled. That is an excellent printer. In fact, the kit version is an excellent printer. This is close, either the best quality 3D printer I own or very, very close. So let's look at some of the characteristics. It has a removable print bed that's made of spring steel. Now this is actually a third party replacement, but you get the idea. It has a filament out sensor. It is a direct drive printer and direct drive printers in my experience are dramatically faster. This is 30 to 40% faster than this Ender 3 in producing a part. Most importantly, it's the only printer in my shop that from the factory was able to print at 300 degrees Celsius and do it safely. So excellent printer, excellent quality. I would not recommend it as a first printer for anyone. There is one absolutely unique feature of the Prusa i3 MK3 among printers targeting home use, small business use, probably the best quality support you can get for a printer thousand dollars or less. The Prusa ecosystem is fine tuned. All the components work together, the hardware and the firmware and the slicer, which are updated often, are fairly tight, very tightly integrated. That's in spite of the fact it's all available open source. So if you have $1,000 to spend for a fully assembled Prusa i3 MK3, fantastic printer, the best printer I own, but maybe not the best printer for your first printer, or even for most hobbyists. In terms of size, it's uh, right in the middle. It has a print surface of 250 by 210 by 210. Okay, let's look at the other end of the spectrum. This is a Creality Ender 3 version 2. 
Now, while initially Creality was not completely open about redistributing their firmware, which is completely Marlin based, now they've gotten very, very good at it. So this Ender 3 version 2 has open is based on open source Marlin firmware, and many people have already created standard Marlin builds for this printer. So you can use the firmware, the software that comes from Creality, or you can use the open source versions that have been modified by other folks. In fact, this particular printer has a BL Touch auto bed leveling system that I added on afterwards. You'll see the 3D printed bracket here. And I'm using an open source version of Marlin that was crafted by a company in Malaysia called Smith 3D. Now this printer is a good size printer, 220 by 220 by 250. And Creality has experimented with different print beds. On um, this printer is actually a print bed that is glass with a special surface on the top that adheres to the surface with clips. Now I wasn't crazy about the Creality surface, so I actually have a piece of build tech on this particular one. This printer sells for about $269, $270 directly from Creality. So I can buy three of these for the cross of this Prusa i3 MK3. So what are the difference? This has basic features. It did not come with an auto bed leveling system. I added that on my own. So to add that, you have to be a bit of a tinkerer. It does come as a kit. The kit will take you 30 minutes to an hour, depending on your skill, versus four to six hours. So much easier to assemble than the Prusa, but still there is an assembly. It does not have a filament out detector. It is a Bowden style printer where the filament comes from the extruder through a tube to the hot end versus the hot end being directly connected to the extruder. And it is much slower. It's at least a third slower because of this Bowden setup and retraction of filament takes time. It's only really rated to 250 degrees C. You might be able to push that with your own version of the firmware and by changing the hot end. But what makes this such a wonderful printer is it's so easily hackable. The Ender 3s are the easiest printers I own to work on. It's easy to get to every adjustment you need to make. It's easy to add third-party components on. So if you're looking for a 3D printer that is truly using a variant of open source firmware, you have good access to alternatives. And what makes it even better is the Ender 3 version 2 is on a 32-bit board with a bootloader. What's a bootloader? Well, bootloader is a little piece of software that's loaded onto the control board that allows it to update itself with new firmware. So if I put a new version of firmware on an SD card in this printer, it will automatically load it. So it's very, very easy to upgrade. As you can see, I'm a big fan of this printer. Let's look at some other alternatives though. Now behind me in the corner here, and it looks just like a large box, is the Monoprice Ultimate 2. What do I like about the Monoprice Ultimate 2? Well, what I don't like is the print surface, print volume is a bit smaller. You can see the difference here. This print surface is only 200 by 150 by 150. So you can print um, a variety of items in there, vases, other things, uh, lots of functional parts will fit in this print area, but it is a little bit small. The Monoprice Ultimate 2 is fully enclosed. That means you can control temperatures more carefully. However, in spite of the fact it's fully enclosed, the hot end fans are not quite as good as they are, let's say, on my Prusa, which has really excellent fans. What's the nicest feature of the Monoprice Ultimate 2? Well, first of all, it has pretty high end features. Auto bed leveling is standard. Filament brake detection is standard. And 
It's a direct drive printer and it's fast. It's as fast as my Prusa i3 MK3, which me means that it's about 30% or more faster than my Ender 3. That's why for me, my go-to printer for a lot of small to mid-sized parts that I'm using for various reviews and videos is the Ultimate 2. It's reliable, it's steady, and it comes fully assembled. So if you're looking for a printer for mid-sized parts, fully assembled, and it's $550, this is $1,000 fully assembled. So a little more than half the price of a Prusa i3 MK3 that's as fast as the Prusa, has a smaller print area, and its top temperature is also about 230 to 250 degrees. The Ultimate 2 is excellent, but it is not at all open source. While the firmware in that Ultimate 2 is probably Marlin based, the manufacturer has not released the source code. So one of the problems is that if that firmware is Marlin based, if they looked at firmware, Marlin used it, used the creative product of the open source authors, they're in violation of the license. But here's the problem with open source. If there's not a company truly behind the open source project, there's no one to enforce the license because a bunch of folks working on the software can't afford the legal fees to take on a corporation that's cheating a bit on open source. So the Ultimate 2, excellent printer, even a good first printer because it's fully assembled, high-end features, $550. Now let's talk about another printer that in some circles is a bit controversial. And that's right here, my ANET ET4. So the ANET ET4 is a very cost-effective printer. It's about $180 to about $230, depending on the model. There are models that have basically a semi-automated auto bed leveling. Doesn't work very well through to models that have true auto bed leveling. There are models that are quieter because of the stepper drivers on the control board. There are models that are noisier. So the price is about 180 to 230. All of the models though are pretty high end components. 32 bit control board, filament detection is built in. They use a glass print surface. They're about the same size as an Ender 3. In fact, if you look at them side by side, they look very, very similar. So the ANET ET4 is basically close to a Ender 3 version 2, 32-bit board, et cetera, with better features, except for the firmware. The firmware that ships with the ET4 is okay. One of the things you want to be able to do with your 3D printer is recalibrate it because these are components that over time or from the factory may need adjustment. Things you want to be able to calibrate are the E-steps. That's how many turns of your stepper motor are necessary to extrude a millimeter of filament. You want to be able to calibrate that. You want to be able to calibrate the temperature of the hot end. Is it honing in on the proper temperature? The temperature of the bed. Those are called PID calibrations. In order to do those, your printer needs to support a set of G-code commands. The Prusa does, the Ender does, actually the Ultimate 2 does, the ANET standard firmware does not. But ANET has been under a lot of pressure because reviewers such as myself have said, you know, the hardware is really good, but your firmware is not quite there. So they are now supporting an effort in the open source community to make Marlin available, standard, off-the-shelf Marlin 2 on their printers. There's an early build of that available now. It'll probably be a few more months till it's stabilized. So let's look at these four printers all together and compare them. If you look at this table, 
you'll see the Prusa on the left and the Anet on the right. So let's go across the table. The Prusa is fully open source. You can even download the plans for the 3D printed parts. The Ender 3 version 2 is mixed. Um, the physical construction is fully proprietary. There are no open source plans for these parts. The firmware that comes with it nowadays is open source, but it may, Creality may not release the source code immediately when they release a new printer. It may take a while, but the community is very active in ensuring the firmware for the Creality printers are available. The Ultimate 2 is mostly the proprietary, and the stock ANET ET4 is proprietary, but there's an effort to make an open source version available. The Prusa and the Ultimate 2 are direct drive, and they're much faster. The Ender and the ANET, the Creality and the ANET are Bowden style printers. The Prusa and the Ultimate 2 have high-end features, auto bed leveling, filament break detection. All of these printers now are designed by the manufacturer to have temperature protection to, so if they fail to properly detect temperatures, they'll shut down the printer. The print areas on the Ender and the ANET are really identical, about 220 by 220 by 250. The Prusa is slightly different, the print area, at 250 by 210 by 210. And the Ultimate 2 is by far the smallest at 200 by 150 by 150. The Ultimate 2 is the only fully enclosed printer here. So if you're printing materials where fine temperature control to minimize warping is important, the Ultimate 2 might be a better choice. Um, it does a pretty good job with PETG, uh, which is a material that sometimes warps. The assembly of the Prusa is by far the hardest. This is a four to six hour or longer assembly if you buy the kit. The Ultimate 2 is fully assembled. The ANET is a very easy assembly. I, I don't think it would take anyone more than 20, 30 minutes. The Ender 3 version 2 is a little harder. It could be an hour or more depending on your skills. In terms of support, there's no question. Prusa gives you the best support. Creality support is okay, but the community is so active, there, there's lots of places to turn for support. Anet and Monoprice have mixed reputations on support. So, does open source matter? This printer is fully open source, but it's the hardest one in some ways to work with. The Ultimate 2 is proprietary, very easy printer to use, no assembly required. So here's how I think about the relationship between open source and 3D printing for me. I have many things in my house. My refrigerator, my television, Basically, every appliance closed source. I don't have any access to the firmware in those products. My automobile has lots of computers, closed source. Matter of fact, it's frustrating how far the GPSs on an automobile lag behind what we have in our phones because automobile manufacturers don't even update them very often. My phone, for that matter, I use an iPhone, closed source. I'm using a Surface Go here with my notes, closed source. So if you're looking to buy a 3D printer as an appliance, something you're going to set up and just use for your hobby or your business, I don't think it matters at all. What matters is the support and does the manufacturer update the firmware to correct for issues. If on the other hand, you want a hackable, modifiable system, you like tinkering, you want to be able to start low price and upgrade, I think the Creality Ender printers are spectacular. This new Ender 3 version 2 with the built-in bootloader is just really easy to work on. If you want the advantages of open source or you just believe in the concept and you want a printer with outstanding corporate support, the Prusa printers are excellent, and 
Feature-wise, this in many ways is the strongest printer I own, but I don't use it very often. And I really don't modify it at all because it's very hard to work on because they embraced open source in such an intense way with all these 3D printed parts that um, it made it hard to work on. So folks, that's my take. There's a place for open source. There's a place for proprietary in the world. Um, they will continue to clearly live together. So if you enjoyed this video today, the first thing you should do is go to forum.drvax.com, register for the forum, and let's discuss this all together. On that forum, you can post pictures, you can have an interactive discussion with hundreds of other viewers of these videos that truly are engaging in building the Dr. Vax community. Also, make sure you subscribe to the video, click on the bell so you know about new videos, share the link to this video with anybody you want, it's free, and let's continue to learn things together.